Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Indie Choice Picks. And today I had the honor of interviewing the famous, and I've been following him on Twitter for a while. He's really good at what he does, Gilbert Deltres. And if you've heard of him, he's the creator of the horror, demon horror comic book Lair and his new piece of work, a Western revenge story called Pistoletta, which is now running on Indiegogo. So, Guys, sit back, relax, grab some popcorn, because we really dove into some pretty cool stuff uh, while we were doing this interview, okay? So enjoy yourselves, leave a comment, like, subscribe, and if you guys like his work, he is running his Indiegogo uh, campaign for Pistoletta, so that'll be in the comment link below. Go down there, check it out. I'll also put down all of his social media contacts and stuff like that, all right? But no! While I was doing the interview, I did not use this mic. I, I, I programmed the wrong mic, so it's actually coming through my computer. It's a little muffled, but you can still hear what I'm saying from time to time. But guys, it's not about me. It's about the creators. Listen to what Gilbert has to say about indie comics, his life, his role as creating, and all the stuff that he's planning on doing from going here to going forward. All right, so enjoy the interview, and guys, have fun. All right, man. Thanks for joining me on my show, Gilbert. Um, I've been following you on Twitter a whole lot. It's been a while, and I've seen you go through this project and uh, layer, and now you're doing Pistoletta. I, I love that uh, you just keep on going. So I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Tell the audience about yourself a little bit, about how you got into comic books. Just give us a whole full rundown. <laughs> Uh, how I got into comics, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I always loved comics straight up. Uh, grew up on comics. Spider-Man was uh, one of my favorites as well as Batman. Um, I love stories, dude. I love storytelling. It's what it is. Um, I get lost in movies. That's another thing, reading, that type of thing. And for me, the power behind comics is incredible. People don't realize that. I mean, if you understand that a picture is worth a thousand words, and just think about a comic book and all the panels you got, you know, that's, that's just imagery that speaks volumes. Uh, also, I see comics as cinematic blueprints. I was always into screenwriting, um, but trying to sell a script is very hard. You know, if you don't have connections, Hollywood connections, you know, they read my script, it don't work. But if you got a comic book, you got, you know, a visual behind what you created it, it helps as far as pitching so i mean for me it was just one and one hand in hand and i started uh under the flesh i was a web comic i did around i want to say 2010 ish around there and then from there we uh did a kickstarter and that that was able to get traction and then from there it was just learning the hard way through crowdfunding because there was a couple of canceled campaigns and the successful ones and Lair and now Pisoleta and like you said now it's like I'm going one after the other and now I hit a good rhythm where I'm going to be keeping them coming <laughs> seriously. Now, how many times did you fail with your Kickstarter before you actually got it right? Okay so interestingly enough with Under the Flesh the first Kickstarter I did for that one was a success um, I financed that whole book out of pocket so what I was trying to do is it was kind of weird. I was kind of get funding to create the second issue, mm -hmm. but only give the rewards for the first issue. Okay. So I don't know. It's kind of backwards. It's like, hey, you get you get an issue one, but we need the art for issue two. Well, so I, I, I've heard of people doing that before. I know a lot of people um, mm -hmm. like they, they would pay like what I'm doing right now with my comic is like I've already paid um, mm -hmm. my ink artist to do all the ink for part one. Mm -hmm. um, like money's already out of my pocket, but you know, the Kickstarter that I'm going to be on I want to uh, mm -hmm. get it into print because I can I can launch it via like you know digital PDF like that, but mm -hmm. it's just something like having a hard copy in your hand. So I kind of get where you're coming from. You make mm -hmm. that into one of those things where like you've already paid the money, uh, but I, I kind of want to see it printed. So yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's it's like that model. It wasn't even something that I was kind of. It wasn't kind of what I wanted to do, but it's kind of how it kind of happened because I did create the first issue with the artist. I put I put the money up front. I wanted to put that risk, but I also want to give something back. I'm like, hey, we want to keep this going. So it's just like you'll get the, fir the first issue, and then you kind of get <laughs> the second one. <laughs> we're making it, so you, it, it's coming. Yeah, and like, it, <laughs> like with the money you would get from running your first Kickstarter, you would actually 
use the money that you made after all the fulfillment has been done. Mm-hmm. Use that money to pay your artist. Say, hey, let's get started on, you know, part two. You know, mm-hmm. like, it's, it's kind of like I mean, Kickstarter is a very fun tool for creative to have, and I've been seeing a lot of that uh, been going a lot lately. Not just with mm-hmm. Kickstarter, but with Indiegogo and with Patreon, creators getting paid to kind of showcase their stuff because mm-hmm. a, a lot of publishers. I mean, like. I don't even know what's going on with the publishing world per se, but um, a lot of publishers aren't really down with some of the concepts that most modern creators are coming up with, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, it's getting to more uh, in a gray area with the political spectrum, like people want more liberal, I guess, stories to be told, as opposed to just having a story that's good on its own merit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, for real, the landscape now with storytelling and just with mainstream, you know, media and how they pick books and how they're telling stories, it's kind of touch and go. Yeah. Um, so I think with crowdfunding and the comics and what we're seeing where there's definitely like a renaissance where we're seeing books that we wish we'd see being put, not to say that there's not good stuff being put out, um, cause there is, but then at the same time, there's this stuff that even people that, you know, are reading, they're like, eh, it's just, you know, the same creators that are notable and prominent, just churning out other stuff. And it's just nothing that's in some cases maybe might be grabbing people, but where you see indie comics with, um, like projects that we're seeing on Indiegogo projects we're seeing on, um, Kickstarter, we're seeing a lot more stories being told in different ranges as well, uh, encompassing different types of stuff. You have your political stuff. You have your SJW type stuff. If you look at Kickstarter, a lot of their projects, features we love or whatever, a lot of it falls under that banner just by just seeing it. Uh, Like with that really woke material, which is not for me, it it doesn't bother me. My whole thing as a creator, as a storyteller is to create my narratives and my message if I'm trying to put a message out is to do it organically yes. like I know what propaganda and like you know feminist this and like there's an agenda for everything and I get it what I'm trying to do with my stories is to create an organic story that might make people open their eyes to certain things but do it through the storytelling don't do it through just like hammering the you know hammering the the no you know right on your nose with the hammer you can't do I'm that forcing that 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 narrative onto people and I, I like I was talking um, if you saw my first interview with uh, Insane Comics, uh, mm-hmm. Insane is kind of like, uh, he's kind of like you and me. He, 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 he's talking about, you know, the narrative with his story to where they don't want to be politically motivated or driven or anything like that. Like, at the end of the day, and I kind of see this, and I'm not really sure what's going on with the comic book community with this mm-hmm. whole comic gate thing. Like, I'm new to this. Like, I literally just hashtag it. Like, I, I, funny story, I hashtagged it because I saw you, you were, you were doing great which is layer Kickstarter, it was fantastic. And so I was like, ah, maybe I can get some some information from the audience, right? Let me let me let me tweet this out. So I tweeted out, um, what's a good way to run a successful Kickstarter? Hashtag indie comics, hashtag comics. And then I saw the the hashtag comic gate for well, like the first time I was like, oh that looks inviting. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like I typed it in there and bro, you wouldn't believe how much just negative stuff that came from people who just were not down with the mm-hmm. comic case. And I was like, what is this comic? What did I hashtag? Is there, did I do something wrong? So I went in and looked and saw what was going on. And the moral of the story is, is that I didn't really get an answer for my question at all. Like, mm-hmm. It was just people just bashing me for using a hashtag. And I was like, where? Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't, they had the word comic in it. So I just thought that it was something that was good mm-hmm. to use. But Going back, yeah, Zane was kind of in the same spectrum as you, as you and me, and I, I told him, um, like, you want to tell the story that you want to tell. You don't want to tell mm-hmm. the story that you think how to kill to what is the wise story. And I think that's the whole rift that's going on right now in the mm-hmm. community is that writers are trying to pander and appeal to an audience who mm-hmm. wouldn't set foot inside of a comic book store at all. It's all about mm-hmm. making money. And to me, that's kind of offensive if you're pandering to a certain community because mm-hmm. you want to make money and you're not pandering to a community, community mm-hmm. to read your comics in terms of, well, I think this would be great for them not to make it up. Mm-hmm. That's why I marvel in a lot of the DC comic books are kind of starting to really like, mm-hmm. fine. And I, like, I, that's just my opinion. And I know mm-hmm. Get on Twitter, like walking into a wildfire, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> no, you're onto something with the. Uh, 
I mean, I've been, there's been a major disconnect with me as far as Marvel and DC is concerned. When I grew up, I was big on Marvel and DC and, and, and but just when I became more into wanting to create stories, I'm like, I've already seen, you know, there's so much you can see with Spider-Man. There's so much you can see with Batman. Like, I mean, you could only reinvent so many times. So for me, there was just, it was nothing appealing. I was driven more towards the indie type stuff, like the image comics, you know, uh, like the walking dead, believe it or not, kind of got me back into comics. I'm like, okay, wow, this is, cause I always love uh, end of the world scenarios, zombie genre type stuff. That was my thing, horror. Of course, reading it after eight, nine books and volumes, it's almost like, okay, man, you got to kind of, you need closure somewhere. As much as I love that, it, it kind of got me back into comedy. I started following a lot of other stuff, a lot of other creators, but there's, there's been a major downfall as far as where Marvel's headed, where DC's headed, trying to, with this political correctness, it's just, it's horrible. Yeah. And it's, it's killing. Um, and that's why comics get kind of formed. I'm like you were at first, I didn't know much about comics. Yet. I was doing some research and me as an indie creator, I saw, okay, I kind of align with the vision of comics gate in that they don't want to pander. They just want to create their stories. Okay. And some people are like, Oh, comics gates, a hate group. Oh, they're not about diversity. Well, I'm diverse as it comes. You're diverse as it comes as far as writers concerned. And me, my story, like if you look at Pistoleta as an example, it's a Western. Yeah. My, my protagonist is a Mexican team. Why did I pick a Mexican team? because I wanted to write a damn Mexican team. That's just something I want to do as, uh, as someone who loves Westerns. And me, I'm a, I'm a Latin American, right? Mm -hmm. So I like to, I don't know about you, but sometimes I like to identify with a character. Yeah. And in a lot of Westerns, you know, you got your John Wayne type, your Clint Eastwood man with no names, and they're badass, your Charles Bronson type. They're badass. You know, you could connect with them. But a lot of times, you know, the bad guys are like, you know, the mustachioed Mexican dudes or whatnot. They're kind of one dimensional. I'm like, you know what? I want to try to create a character that could be Mexican and, and a badass. But okay, we've seen Clint Eastwood. So we've seen that. So I'm like, how do I differentiate? How do I make it unique? And then I thought, one of my major inspirations, Quentin Tarantino, um, Robert Rodriguez. I'm telling you, I'm a film dude. So I'm like, I kind of like it, like Django Unchained. I love what they did with that. Um, very edgy, controversial, that type of thing. But, you know, Jamie Foxx in that role was excellent. So I'm like, okay, what could I do for Western that hasn't been done before? And I don't know why the idea of a pregnant chick with a gun, just somehow that image just rocked me. I'm like... I'm like, okay, now if I go into making her Mexican team, what, what could I do? Then I started researching the Mexican-American war. Texas was under Mexican control for a while. Mm -hmm. And then Texas became independent. They became a republic. They got their, you know, their own independence. During that time, there was a lot of Mexicans still living on Texan property. It was just how it was. So a lot of them were driven off their land. You had them, uh, the, the rangers as, as uh, what you call all the, oh man, I can't even think right now. The border patrol, like they had the patrol rangers, they had the, you know, the, so there was a lot of friction there. Racism, it's just, it's just history, man. Okay, but so for me, I felt, okay, this time space would be excellent to have like this sheriff, Texan sheriff, newly formed town, comes in and he's just running this Mexican family off. And they're like, this is our land, we, you know, or not our land, or at least this is our home. This is all we know. Like, I don't want to let it go, but like, amigo, you better get off this property. So, of course, they get killed. She sees this. He doesn't kill her because she's about 15-year-old teen, but he takes advantage of her, takes her innocence. And then from there, I felt like you have the platform for a great story incorporating what I want to incorporate, but not make it preachy, not make it about, just let it flow organically. Mm -hmm. And the story, you know, and just... That's, you know, just to touch on that. But anyway, that's where Comics Gate features diversity. It's just an ideology yeah. in that we want to make stories where just what we want to do with no agenda, with none. Yeah, exactly. And if you do have a message, not to say that you can't, yeah. but you do it narratively. You do it through, you know, it's not like this is my issue. You know, it's not like when I promote a police lead, I'm not about, oh, hey, female rights. Hey, we got a Mexican person of color as our hair. It's just like, no, it's about a revenge story and it's badass. Check it out. Cause that's how I want to market my stuff. You I know? agree. Now, like, going back to what you said about just, you know, having a story like where like identity politics and political politics is really mm -hmm. meaningful. Now, I, I got in a comic book, my very first comic, if you might remember, it was Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and oh hell yeah! I love oh, it because yeah. the story, like that whole, like I still read it to this day. It's one of mm -hmm. the comics that I pick up every once Wednesday, every month on Comic Book Day, and it's not about Miles just being a black kid. And they make real emphasis on he's not just black; he's also mm -hmm. Puerto Rican, you know. Oh, yeah. 
That was my people right there, half and half. You gotta love that. Man. <laughs> it's not about him being those those two minority races about fatherless kids for one, but his story, mm-hmm. his narrative, and mm-hmm. his struggle to live mm-hmm. up to Peter Parker. As being Hell yeah, I love that. I love That's that. What I love. Those are the You're giving of- me chills right now, dude. I got yeah, goosebumps. So I, I don't even see too. the camera right now. I got goosebumps. <laughs> That's That's when you do it right, you know. That, it was fantastic, and it is great that they did that because not only that, you know, minorities who are, you know, coincidentally maybe these black folks or you know, both at a certain pick up a mile from reality, they don't think, oh, maybe I can be Spider Man too. They think like, no, this is a great story. What can I do mm-hmm. to to do to 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 what am I looking for that? To mm-hmm. to the storytelling and stuff like that. These are kids mm-hmm. that are or readers that are trying to figure out what they can do in terms of mm-hmm. being creative. Not mm-hmm. writing the story, making someone gay or trans or anything like that, focusing all the emphasis on them being trans or gay mm-hmm. and just kind of BSing the story. That doesn't, that is, I, I, I can't even that. No, I hear you. I, I, I'm, I'm at the point where I, I'm with you 100%. Now, I almost kind of want to do it as a challenge because I'm, I'm not a gay person. I do have gay friends, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm Christian. And just about being preachy, like one of my other books, Lair, there's a spiritual message attached in there, but I, I want to do it subtly. I want to do it organically. I just want to just try to make you leave you with something to think. I don't want to beat it over your head like some of these, if you see these contemporary Christian movies, it's just, it's just like, come on. It's almost like SJW type, how they want to just, I get it. I'm Christian. I get it. You know, we want to, we want to put the message out, but you got to construct something realistic where someone who maybe doesn't care about God or know about God, but could read this, might think, Wow, life after death. I didn't really think about that. And maybe you get him to think. But to 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 hit on what what you were saying, I almost want to write a story about a gay character because I want to show that you could make a gay superhero and make him really good, but don't but don't make it about, hey, we got a gay superhero. If you're gay, you gotta support No, make a story. Even Marvel could do this because they're they just have the brand behind it. They could just make a totally new superhero, right? brand new superhero and you can apply it to today's world right let's let's create something that's tragic for me if i do it i'd, I'd use an active shooter scenario because a lot of times that's what's go- it happens in high school yeah. and it's, it's a it's a dark it's dark and touchy subject but you have let's say for example our gay superhero uses his powers to stop an active shooter incident while it's happening mm-hmm. and let's say he saves a day all this and you know you see his struggle you kind of see like he's the outcast because he's gay or whatever or it's just not open, he's in the closet or whatever. But then, like, he does this, he saves the day, and, like, they want to talk to him. You know how the media is. Hey, what, how'd you do this or that? And he does his little speech. Hey, I did this. Okay, great, whatever. But at the end, he's like, yeah, and I'm gay. And it's just like, okay, like, wow. You know, but you just do it in a way where people are like, wow, he's a gay dude. But hold up. He was heroic. He was this. He was that. And you just see that he's still a decent person and a human being, but he just happens to be gay, right? Like, it's just do it in a way where you're not – you get what I'm saying? Where you're not yeah, selling you're not, it out and you're not making it gimmicky. You're not, you're not trying to make a point by being too straightforward, but you're being so subtle about it that people still understand what you're talking about. Yeah, don't be too, like, Jesus. If that's where, a matter of fact, a great storyteller, if, if, if that's what you do, it's a way to do it. It's almost like unbiased. Mm-hmm. Like you're doing it in a way that's not showing bias, but at the same way, you're doing it in a way that's sub, sub like subversion to get your point. Like you're doing it in a way that not right on the nose, not in your face. You know, you got to leave something for the reader to process and put together. And I think that's what a lot of audiences today, I think that's a lot of the problem when it comes down to any form of media is that they're trying to force it to them. Like, uh, I remember this season of Supergirl, and I just, I love Supergirl. I love watching it because it's a fantastic mm-hmm. show. And then they like downgraded Superman doing the whole um, 50 years crossover for that. Uh, Supergirl was like all of a sudden like awesome. And then mm-hmm. they had that one transgender character who's actually a transgender in real life, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. But she's transgender in the show as well. And, you know, she's an alien. And all the women in her family, uh, they inherit powers. But she got the powers. And I'm asking myself, like, wait, how, how would you get powers if you're not biologically a woman? That doesn't make sense. And mm-hmm. if it's that kind of pandering that just makes me like, why are you? Her being transgender literally has no effect, mm. effect on the plot whatsoever. It's nothing, and you can't even shoe it in in a decent way. It's just like no. it's it's and that's where it becomes political. It's where you're just like, 
playing that 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 agenda and it's not it's just come on man it's just you get tired of it now, if they were to change like the mythos of how you know she got the power like maybe the, her powers aren't what they thought they were maybe not all the women in her family were her that would be perfectly fine great but you specifically established this concept mm -hmm. of women in this family establishing people's powers at a certain mm -hmm. point but you're not biologically a woman you're mm -hmm. a man. it's just but when you come off and you tell people that they kind of get all into your head like i like the idea of you saying that you want to make a, a gay people like i have a lot of characters written that are gay and that are trans mm -hmm. Um, and like I would actually again Twitter don't ever do what I do on Twitter because it always backfires <laughs> one point or another. But I got on Twitter one day and I was just like, "We'll make the transgender transgender." Like completely, like straightforward question because I'm trying to develop this. You're trying to know. You're doing research. You're fact finding. No, because all the all the stuff you find online is very it's two sided. You, you don't get a straight answer from one side. You don't get a straight answer from the other side. Mm -hmm. Logical way to do it would be what to ask the community. Yeah, we make the transgender transgender man, and I think I got attacked for close to a week for asking that question. And I'm like, I, I just needed information about you about the community to fully develop this character because like a great writer would do. You're getting exactly. research, man. Is but and and his, and this is where they would hit you back with, you don't have a right to to, to write exactly. that story. Exactly, and that's what a lot of people said. And I go, that's nonsense. You guys so. want to be represented in media, and here's uh, independent writers here who's trying to represent you guys, and you guys are completely hiding your head off. Like, I think there was probably one cooperative person who gave me an article to read that was very helpful mm -hmm. in developing this character that's going to come through and some more of my work later on down the road. And I, you know, I think that person was like, thank you, great. But I mean, out of, I think, 400 something comments. It was a lot of comments. Out of 400 something comments and death threats that I got wow, from people, lot. it was one person who said, you know, I can't really explain to you because it's a lot to go through, but here's this PDF, check it out. Um, it should be able to help you out a lot. And I was like, thank you. Like three days later after I, I tweeted that out. Mm -hmm. it just, I, I, I don't, I honestly don't do it. Like, I'm not doing it to pander. I'm doing it to mm -hmm. make sure you guys are represented in the right way. Yeah, you're doing your homework. You're not just like that's. I mean, with anything, as a writer, like I think, oh, what's um Stephen King kind of said something alluding to this, where you know, you have to be true to your characters. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you just have to be true to your characters. So for me, you know, like I'm Christian, and 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 if I'm writing a character and he's using foul language or something, you know, my wife will be like, "What? Well, we shouldn't write." I'm like, "Hun, you gotta understand. Listen to me. I'm writing a character. Like this is what this. Did he say this?" Like, I got to say true to what he say. I got to say true. You know, I just got as a, as a, that's my responsibility as a writer to, to do as best as we can. You know, if I'd write a gay superhero, right, I'm not gay, right? I mean, I do have gay friends, but I'd research from a theological perspective because me, myself, I've read articles where a kid that was gay, his dad was like a preacher or something and he ends up committing suicide. So he kind of told his dad and dad's like, no, how could you do this? How could you do that? But I'm thinking like, hey, okay as a Christian person, right, we are supposed to be loving and we're supposed to be non-judgmental. Yeah, we're not perfect, right? So we got to like show like Christ's love. So it's just almost like, hey, listen, even though it's not our, it's not what we would do, but at the same time, I, as a person, you know, I respect you, you know, as a person, hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to judge you. And people think, oh, you're Christian, you must hate me. I don't hate you, dude. Like, I don't. I just don't. But that's where the misconception is in our society. So that's why I feel like more narratives could enlighten, you know, and think a gay, char gay character is a part, like a, a good one, but make it organic. Touch on real things that are they're experiencing. Don't just, you know. And it also, like, when pander. you touch on real, real issues that uh, these people are facing, it actually kind of builds the basis for a, a fantastic factual for these characters, mm -hmm. you know? You know, that I, I remember I was writing a character, um, this isn't for another project, but I'm going to drop the thing to me right so, uh, mm -hmm. I have a character who's a half human and she's Muslim, um, but mm -hmm. her vice is actually, she's the incarnate of luck. You know, Muslims are not going to have sex like marriage. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in, in my story that I wrote for her, she's 16, she has sex, and it actually triggers her, her demon ability to where she actually murders this her boyfriend for the first time she knows she had it, right? That's cool. Um, and as a result, you know, her father, who's strict, heavy Muslim, is more or less like, you know, you're not my daughter anymore because you just 
Mm -hmm. They kind of mold that character into the person she will become in the story and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes down to writing characters, it doesn't matter if they're black, white, Latino, Martian, mm -hmm. other galaxies, LGBTQ, I, I don't care. But if you give mm -hmm. that character a, a solid backstory and they can resonate with you, not as a member of that minority group, but as a, a reader in general, you can relate to that person and kind of feel for that character. Mm -hmm. That's when you've done a good job. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if they're gay or trans or born a woman and now they're a man or somehow turned into an effing giraffe. I don't care. Mm -hmm. If you can craft up a fantastic backstory about who they are, who they were, who mm -hmm. they are now, and kind of make it to where it's a narrative to which people can resonate with. Mm -hmm. Personally. You, you when you brought up the Muslim, right? It's funny that you say that because there was a pitch that I sent to Image Comics and um, the the main character, okay, he was half black, he was half Korean. Mm -hmm. I, ju I just made him that. I just, Blasian, right? That's what you were like, Blasian, right? I just, I just I, I, I'm like, okay, he's going to be this specific makeup. His mother's going to be Korean American. The dad's black American. They get together and he's, his name's Corey Lancer, right? Mm -hmm. He's a smart kid. He's in college for engineering, on his, like, doing his thing. But of course, he's in love, right? And he happens to be in love with a Muslim chick, okay? A Muslim girl. Sorry if I said chick and I offended some SJW out there. She's in love with a Muslim girl, right? And his issue is that she doesn't want to take him home to the family. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, as you know, right, Muslims, they're very, they're strict. Yeah. When it comes to dating outside of their own religion, it's a problem. And also, there's, in case, there's cases, um, if it's Muslim Arabs, where they don't even... Um, typically want to date outside their own race as well. Like, it's like, you know, just stay within your race. Anyway, he's upset because he's like, I just want to, I want, I want to, I want to be shown like I'm worthy. I want your parents to know that I'm a worthy suitor. Like I'm worthy for you. She's like, you got to understand. It's just my culture. My dad is a certain way. Like I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. And they're butting heads because he wants to be validated. And she's like, I do validate you. I do love you, but you just got to hold on. And it's just my, fa so I thought, it represents what's probably going on in the real world. And so I'm sure there's some couples that could relate in biracial. It doesn't even have to be necessar necessarily Muslim or any, but just the whole biracial aspect of it. It's, symb it, it's, it's symbolic of the world we live in. Yeah. And I thought that just, I didn't even go into his powers. I didn't go into I'm just talking just on his yeah, real world self. Powers. I'm more intrigued in the story between him and the girl. Exactly. And that's what you do as far as a writer with your Muslim character and how she lets out her demon. And it's, I'm kind of intrigued at that. And it's like how you're intrigued how this relationship is going to end up without even knowing anything. else. That's what we need to show in the comics of today. It's almost like I know for some people it's touchy. Oh, well, biracial. Uh, you can ignore all that, but I'm going to show you or my mission is to show you that I can write stories using minority leads. You like kind of like Jordan Peele just to, just to try to create fresh stuff. Yeah as far as a diverse cast, but not make it about, hey, we're celebrating diversity, making it, hey, I can incorporate these elements and make a story that's going to just blow your mind and make you think about the real world in front of us because that's the real craft. 100, I agree. You know? I, I, I guess this is another reason why I'm, I'm doing these shows to kind of get creators like you. And it's, it's, I'm welcoming all creators. That's why when I... Yeah, for sure, no doubt. When I sent out the video and I made it, that video was supposed to be about a thousand views by now. And I did it sometime last week. So it's getting a lot of rep representation of me inviting people. And I invite everybody out, whether you're coming or not. Like, mm -hmm. I want to know, like, if, if your story resonates with me, like, I want to know, like, what got you to that point. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I base a lot of these interviews on how you present, like, your Kickstarter. Like, you know, mm -hmm. are you presenting, like, is it something that I would whip out money and buy? You know, because mm -hmm. I don't know you personally. I, I see you on Twitter. I don't know Zane personally, but I see him on Instagram and Twitter. And mm -hmm. you guys are always promoting your work. And, you know, I, I, I look at it and I see your presentation on your Kickstarter Indiegogo platform. And I'm like, that's probably something I would read. You know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're selling your your, your content to people mm -hmm. with Kickstarter. And I, I, I ask myself, like, what would it be like if I found a Kickstarter that I really like back to? What I want to know more, and that's what kind of got me. Like, Why don't you just set up interviews? I mean, you got this freaking mm -hmm. thick ass mic right here. <laughs> yeah, not, that's, that's, that's what we call a studio mic. Yo, I love this. This is great. I mean, it was like <laughs> on Amazon. 
this whole the neck part of it was kind of a pain in the ass. Kind of nice. Scary, but it was, it was, to me, it was worth it. I get into my office. And I see the yeah. So it's great picking your brain. So I kind of want to get into mm -hmm. uh, your work really quick. Um, I like I wanted to get into like layer yeah. and stuff like that. Okay. You see yeah. my screen right now? Um, it says you started screen sharing. Yeah, I got it. You see your your Kickstarter right here? Yes, sir. All right. So I wanted to kind of get into like your layer your idea for that and stuff like that. Cause I remember you were you were on Twitter um, and you were getting a lot of backlash for um, the content of your book and a lot of people who wanted to challenge the idea. Um, kind of goes back to what we were talking about before about the story versus uh, what you see on the surface and stuff like that. So the mic is yours. Kind of explain to the audience like what this is. I'm, I'm really kind of bad confession that I didn't get in on this Kickstarter when you had it open. So I, I really wanted to do this. But I, I just missed it by a long time. So, but uh, tell the audience about what you got going on here with Lair. Well, Lair is my first complete book. So for that, I'm, I'm kind of excited about because what I was told you about Under the Flesh was a webcomic. We kind of got into three issues and my artist was uh, bombarded with Marvel work, which was awesome because some of the Under the Flesh got him uh, some Marvel work. So that was cool. But we had to put it on, on the back burner for a while. Um, and I said, okay, what am I going to do? I can't just wait for him to be available. So I said, okay, let me start my next project. Lair been on my mind for a long time. It started out as a short story. Um, and it's my take on, um, I kind of want to say spiritual horror. I know that's kind of like spiritual horror. Is that even a thing? Um, I was talking to, to, to uh, Zane, my last interview. I was mm -hmm. talking, there's a niche for everything. Like I thought, mm -hmm. mermaid vampires. Mm -hmm. I never heard of mermaid vampires, but it was intriguing to hear. So I mm -hmm. think at this point in the creation process, I mean, you can come up with anything. Yeah, and that's the beauty of comics and that's the beauty of storytelling. There's always something out there and it's just a matter of finding what it is and making it fresh. For me, like I said, I'm Christian and I, and I kind of, I, I don't know, I'm just that Christian dude that loves horror, okay? It's just what it is. I grew up on horror. I, it's not that it, <laughs> when you're a little kid and you get exposed to some nightmare on Elm Street or, you know, the <laughs> 80s horror movies, child's play and all that, it, things stick with you. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why you should be sleeping as a little kid and not creeping around seeing what your dad's watching on TV because <laughs> he doesn't even know I was watching that. But it just <laughs> opened my mind. It's just like, what? and I just, it just fixated on horrors tales from the crypt is another you know stephen king book so you horror has been is my thing you watch <laughs> supernatural right Come on. huh you watch supernatural right i have watched supernatural and supernatural is is it's it's, it's a huge show there's a there's a lot of there's so much filler episodes but they're good filler episodes and it's it's goes all over the place i go but, once a week with my wife i go you need our, our weekly dose of family I don't care what the episode is. Just turn on family Dean and just get that weekly dose of it. I love that show. Supernatural is special, and if if any fans of Supernatural will definitely find something they like out of Lair because it's it's again it's it's my it's my 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 way of doing something new with horror because people like look at horror and they might see it as only for me horror there's so many sub genres of horror you got your creature features you got your slashers um you got your supernatural horror um it is so much that you can do with it so for me i'm like okay if i try to do a spiritual take on it what would i do and i saw this stephen king tv movie the langoliers langoliers i remember yeah. that with a little mouth that like the most horrible Fiji movie I've ever watched before. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> the, the Langoliers actually, they were like, they eat time or something like that. Yeah, I saw that. I was, I remember watching that with my mom in like, I think in, in the 90s. And I was like, this is a weird movie. But exactly. So what, what, what particularly stuck with me with Langoliers was the idea of just people vanishing. So we saw the people that didn't vanish and we followed their story on the plane and how time stopped. And this, my mind was like, where are the people that vanish? Where'd they go? So that was kind of the, the seeds for Lair. So I also like anime. One of my favorite animes um, was, is Death Note. I don't know if you ever if you watched Death Watch Note. That. The movie on Netflix sucks. Yeah, definitely awesome. doesn't hold up to, to the anime. The anime for me is just, it's classic. I, I love that concept. 
So for me, and then of course, exorcism movies, the conjuring universe, it's another thing. So it's like my mind is coalescing all these different things. Of course, a spiritual message. So I'm like, okay, what could I do with Lair? I'm like, okay, we have a dimension, right? Where people vanished in the world because everyone disappears. They summon into, they get summoned into this dimension where demons lurk before they possess someone. So my, so my whole thing is like demons are here and we've seen, you've seen the possession movies, right? Where, you know, anyone could get possessed or not anyone, but my idea is like, if you're weak willed, if your soul's, you know, ripe enough, a demon knows he could, he can incorporate that body. So he goes through this portal and boom, he gets into the human. Okay. So let's possess it. If he gets exercised, boom, he gets shot back into lair. And it's just, they could see us. It's like this overlapping dimension. They see us and they just, they go in for who they want. Um, so that's where everything started. The main character is like a faithless person. He's dating someone who's religious. It's also an interrelational relationship. There's also a little, not a lot, but I, I touch on some things, politics, up, but very subtle. It's just to get the story along. Let's introduce the characters, see how they think. Mm -hmm. But then we see his struggle. We see him in this dimension. And all of a sudden we see where faith could kind of come in and that. And so I kind of play around with that. Um, as far as the backlash, I don't know the backlash I got on Twitter because I, I did when I was comics gate I did get a lot of backlash and I know from this being a kickstarter to then jump on Indiegogo which is a, a mainly comics gate heavy platform yeah. I'm just doing what I need to do as a creator to survive and to create content and I know there's people that back kickstarter and I know there's people that back Indiegogo I'm like hey I got an awesome book here I want to do a bigger printing because I want to go to conventions and this and that so I said you know what I'll open it on um, Indiegogo and I did great and um, it was successful, so now I'm, I'm keeping the story going. But I was in like in there with like Twitter or anything like that. But I, I remember you tweeting out that you had some people who were looking at Lair uh, and had some issues with it, and you kind of tweeted out, you know, I'm Christian, um, but you know, my book is kind of like for everybody. I remember reading a tweet like that. I could be wrong. No, 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 you're right. Because now that I remember it, I, I, okay. Here's the funny thing. I tried promoting Lair on a, a Reddit group. It was a Christian group. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm a Christian who writes horror. Um, let me know what you think of Lair, yada, yada. And it got, you know, there's some good reception there. But then it also, I guess, the moderator or something saw it and it just, they eventually closed it out. But they, they were like, oh, that's of, that's of the devil or that's, uh, that's yeah. of hell or that's of the – I'm just like, man, you're limiting your mind if that's really what you're thinking, Reddit, you know? Reddit is not the best place to post stuff. I remember, like, I, when Captain Marvel came out – I wasn't a fan of Free Larson because of what she was you know, feeling. And I love how Thor kind of shut her down with her but <laughs> that's mm -hmm. a story for next time. But um, I set aside my differences with Free Larson and look at the movie. And I did a video about how great the movie was and I posted it on Reddit. And I think within five minutes, the movie got removed and I was saying, what the fuck is in the subreddit? And I go, what? They tried to play it off as like, oh, you're trying to self-promote yourself. And I'm like, well, how do you know that I made this video, first of all? Second of all, there's a lot of people already talking in the comments about oh, how you're a Captain Marvel leader, uh, blah, 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 blah. It just, it's more gatekeeping, even in Reddit. There's gatekeeping yeah. everywhere. And it's I what it like, did any of you actually watch the video and see, like, you know, I actually talked good about the movie, not about Brie Larson as the actor. Literally, as the movie, and she did do a great job portraying Carol Danvers in that movie, one hundred percent. But you know, a lot of people are going to come to the online community. A lot of people don't really look into anything. And again, with Lair, mm -hmm. with your back, like people just immediately thought that, oh, this is the devil's work and stuff like that. There's this really ignorant mindset. If yeah. you can't see a spiritual message come from that, you're limiting yourself. You're limiting your perspective. You're limiting, if you want to even go there, God's effect or God's way of using something like this to put out a good message. Who knows in the, in the grand scheme of things, when it's all said and done, if maybe someone read Lair and it brought them closer to God. I don't know if that happens. That's my mission. That's like, it was just a, a cherry on top of the Sunday. But I also want to create good work. I also want to show that I can produce a mainstream quality type book and have it be, you know, something with a spiritual message, but not preachy. Again, I just want to do it organic. I kind of do, you know, as organic as possible, especially concerning if you think, how, well, how could you be, you know, dealing with a spiritual type message here, but not be preachy? So, again, you have to read the book. And when you read it, you can kind of make your own assertions and then we can talk about it. And but that's kind of what I want to do. Yeah. My take for something like, like Lair is, mm -hmm. okay, well, you know, 
you know, Leia is a supernatural kind of horror, but she also got other stories where the main character is like acting, like you have Devil May Cry, you have Bleach, uh, you have you know, characters in Supernatural that really, you know, introduce Lucifer as a character. Mm-hmm. And to me, that message when you're dealing with somebody who is part of the devil incarnate in some way, that these people who are half demon or whatever are still able to do good in some way, shape, or form, or fashion. And that's the kind of message that I think that are being uh, pushed along with these narratives. Like, you know, Devil May Cry, I was playing Devil May Cry 5 in my life. And it is a great game. And, you know, most of the characters in there are half demon, but you, know, you have Dante and you have Zero who are half demon um, by nature. And yeah, they're a little sadistic, they're a little crazy, they're a little people, but they're in, in the end of everything, they're still good and they still use their human powers to do something, to do something better, you know? And that's what I take away from something like this. I, I would see something like, man, I'm a way, you know, my first impression was uh, this guy was probably an Afghan. I'm like, okay, well, what's the story? I'm not really thinking about well, how many people are going to get killed. Yeah, I'm like, no, you probably have a pretty genuine narrative that needs to be read. I'll I'll send you a, a PDF and you can read it. Um, yeah. yeah, hosting me on your sh- on your on your show here is pretty cool. I appreciate that. We're talking comics. The least I could do is is give you a copy and you can. It'll be a digital copy. You read it and you could you could get more into what I'm trying yeah. to do and just me as a as a storyteller. You know. Um, I love digital copies like that. I love it. I, I, for me, I like to back a lot of people's books because I, I'm like you, like I want to, I want to help people and I understand, you know, uh, how it is what, what crowdfunding. It's rough. I mean, I can only do so much as a dad, you know, who's a, who works for the, who's works for a school. So he's on, he's on a tight budget as it is. So I like the PDF or the digital version for the fact that I can back multiple projects because I could just put $10 here for the PDF or I could put $5 here for the PDF. But for those special, special campaigns, that, like it's like, yeah, I know I'm going to want a physical copy of that. I'll, you know, I'll shell out the twenty dollars if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, but I see a lot of a lot of uh, crowdfunders are doing like, uh, like they're doing like ten dollars and like that. Like the PDF, mm-hmm. um, and then you have like a second one, like twenty bucks where you get the PDF, mm-hmm. and it's a hard copy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people are going for the. Uh, PDF version these days because I mean you can take it anywhere you don't have to worry about it losing it damage mm-hmm. it that you can read it across all devices like iPhones or iPads mm-hmm. I think that's a good really idea yeah, I know a guy who did a Kickstarter on a book that was mm-hmm. only PDF he didn't do any type of printing or anything like that it was strictly PDF and I was like that's mm-hmm. what he thought about that but for all the hassle of getting all the stuff printed and stuff like that and I think he did really well with this Kickstarter right here I mean that did you go over your your pledge amount, or I mean, did you go over your your? So, so here's the thing with the Kickstarter, which was interesting. I have a, I had was able to get 150 backers. I launched that. I think it was 2016, and um, the thing. Now here's the bad thing also with Kickstarter, because at the end of the campaign, you have a lot of declined um, car, cars that could be declined or expired or whatnot. And we had a pledge. I think it was uh, a pretty hefty pledge to be a character in the book or like a mainstay character, something like that. Like if we continue the layered universe, you were like a legit character, something like that. But the fact of the matter is at the end of the day, when they collected the percentage and Kickstarter took their cut and what was left was not what I needed to get the book funded. I was, Oh dude. It Ooh, let me just tell you that. Um, so Again, the show must go on. So I had to shell out oh, some money in my own just with shipping, with, with, with the artist rate and printing. And it, it, 
it, it, it was a process. Then it was a printing, getting the printing done. I was trying to use um, a very small press publisher. It was someone that's not even like a known publisher like Print Ninja or Crack and Print. Um, it was very small press. And I, I contacted them and it was like kind of like back and forth. And I know they must have been extremely busy. But it's like, man, I, I got the book done and I'm literally two, three, four months back and forth. Hey, are we ready? Hey, this, but, and it was, it was so bad, but like I put updates on, on the Kickstarter with copies of the email correspondence because I got to be transparent as possible. I'm like, guys, I didn't expect it to take this long. So I was on Twitter or Facebook, like, Hey, can anyone, you know, recommend like a good printer? Cause print ninja it's still kind of pricey and it's um, in China. So that's a whole other issue too. Uh, and someone recommended crack and print. They said, they'll give me a good quote. And it was a decent deal. And I printed, I want to say like hundred something copies, 125 copies or something like that. So all of those is 150 backers. Not all of them were for physical copies. Okay. So, so 125, it left me to, enough to, to just for my physical backers and maybe two or three copies for myself or whatever. So it was very, very limited. And I'm like, man, I can't do conventions. I can't do anything. Um, so that's where the idea to do the Indiegogo came from. So it's like, okay, I have this awesome concept. I'm like, let me put it on Indiegogo and I'll put a thousand dollar goal, just something. Cause that thousand dollars, maybe I could do a print run for a hundred copies or something like that. And it got up to 6k, which was great. So we used that for a big, big printing. And this is another dilemma because crack and print is really, really killing me on the delays. Really? Uh, dude, this is already a finished book. So all I did was change one page instead of having the traditional Kickstarter credits. Hey, thank you. I took that out because it's for Indiegogo. And I said, let me use this page to promote the next book that I'm going to be doing with the, the layer artist. Okay. So we did that and we put that in. And again, the campaign finished, I want to say late December. I had the in-demand store open and I'm back and forth again with Crack and Print. Okay, and this is Crack and Print now who hooked me up with the first order. I'm like, okay, can we get this order done? Yada, yada, yada again. Okay, boom. Put in the order. This was, started talking with him in early February. So by February 20 something, I put in the order. And he said it was going to be six to five to eight weeks offset printing. Okay, great. It's been eight weeks, literally yesterday. And I sent the email. I'm like, it's been eight weeks. What's the status? So I don't think I'm ever going to use crack and print anymore for, to, for printing just because I get delays, but at the same time, you know, within that time frame, I didn't get any, you know, you don't hear that. You said five to eight weeks. I said, I'm going to give you the eight weeks. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Maybe I'll hear something within the fifth week. Hey, your order's going to be shipped. Hey, nothing, nothing. Crickets chirping. So when the eight week came literally just yesterday, I sent the, an email out that I'm going to cut, take a picture of that, and I'm going to send it to all my backers and be like, hey, guys, there's only so much I can do. I want to create the content. I want to get it to you in your hands at a certain time. So this is just what's killing me. Now, people will be like, well, hey, you didn't fulfill Lair, so why are you doing Pistoleta? Well, Pistoleta is with a different art team. I got that Kickstarter funded, so I want to do the big printing. I'm going to do that with Kablam now. So I'm just trying to get people in on it through the Indiegogo. That's and again, I'm just putting stuff out there. That's what I used for my first uh, comic print. I did a comic way back in 2012. Artwork is horrible. This is why I discontinued it. But I used some blams for that print, and they were very, they were really big on communicating. And doing it. They're good. They're better. Yeah, they're better. I don't and think now, I'll just stay with Kablam. If that's if this proves to be really good, I, I might just stay with them because I, yeah. that's all I want. With Kablam, though, like I, I printed a, a basic normal comic. Uh, my my series, the graphic series, which is kind of like an offshoot of my book that I wrote forever ago. Um, mm -hmm. It was basically a 20 to 25 page issue. And I just came in shoot 20 to 25 pages each. And mm -hmm. the plan was probably like $4 and some change to print, which is great. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing that my next project is going to be a bit bigger in terms of uh, page count. So mm -hmm. I looked at Kablam and for anything over 64 pages is considered a paperback. Like a graphic novel, but they, they call it a paperback. It's yeah. kind of cost to, to them. I think it was about nine dollars and thirty cents. Um, for how? For a, a copy? For for like a copy of like seventy pages, it was like nine dollars and some change for that graphic novel. Per unit for you? Yeah. That's incredible. That's not good. That's not good at all. But how? But, wait. How many were you ordering? 
I would that would be the quote for one copy. But oh they, well, sometimes like for the one copy, it could be like that. But if you're gonna do like two hundred or you're gonna order five hundred, it should not be nine something. Yeah, no, they cut it down. But I did find another comic printer, um, and it's actually from the guy I'm interviewing tomorrow from uh, E10 Comics. Um, he used Comic Well Street. And I might try them too. Yeah, that's another yeah, one. Yeah, there. I looked at a quote from them for one book to print. It was seven dollars or something. So it's not a big savings. It's two dollars. But I mean, yeah. that's two dollars from the book. But over more copies, it was just yeah, probably see a bigger cut. And I think I think after like two hundred fifty copies, you get like a discount mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. dollars or something like that. So comics mm -hmm. all screens is where I'm looking at to get my next project printed of seventy pages. Um, and so, it's something to look into, you know. Yeah. To crack and print's credit, though, I mean, when I got the Lear books from Kickstarter, they were just incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude. I'll get to that. Like when you see it, like it was breathtaking. I'm not going to lie. Um, but my whole thing is that it's just, it's taking so long. Like, it's just like, it's eight weeks. I don't know it's if like, I can, come I, on, man. I don't know if I can stick with that, that blame. Like with, uh, it's a blam. I think it took them like, cause I was going to a convention and I needed my stuff like a week before this make sure it's okay. And they were really good. I think it took them like close to about two weeks to like tag it and ship. And I was looking forward to like a big box on my porch, but it was actually just like they saran wrapped the whole issue and just put in by like the side of an Amazon box and just shipped it my way. And I was like, oh, this is very like convenient because I don't have to haul a box of books into my house. Right. But yeah, the crack and print boxes were also the same. They were they were very manageable, so I'll give them credit on that. Um, I know offset printing usually takes more longer because the quality, so. Again, I mean, it's just that it's taking so long and the book's already done and it's, yeah. I'm trying to find the, I'm trying to follow like the rules. Like, okay, I should probably shouldn't launch until this book is fulfilled, but I got a different art team and it's like, I'm like, I'm just, I'm, I'm putting it out there. Hopefully, you know, people could understand that I've done Kickstarters before and they're going to get their product. I'm not trying to, you know, play any kind of games in that respect. Um, but one thing I do, do one thing I will do, uh, I, with the Lair artist, that team, I have another book coming out. We're trying to do that launch in June. I ain't going to do that launch if, if everyone doesn't get their Lair copy. Like, that's something I have to make sure. Like, that's something where it's like, okay, I'm not going to go crazy launching. But, no, I, like, that's my cutoff. You know, I figure you could have two in the back burner or two, like, cooking. But for that third one, I'm making sure they, you know, at least Lair and Fusa Lair will be fulfilled by then, hopefully. But. So, let's, let's get to the meat of this. I like talking to you, man. <laughs> We're all over the place. Yeah. It's great, but um, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk to the reason why we're really doing this, uh, okay. this, this interview with you. I want to, I want to know more about your letter. You kind of touched on it a little mm -hmm. bit earlier in the interview. Um, but, you know, tell the fans, you, you ran it on Kickstarter. Kickstarter was success. Now you're doing it on Indiegogo for people who missed the Kickstarter. They can go mm -hmm. on Indiegogo and mm -hmm. see a pledge and, you know, get this copy. So tell, tell the audience, like, what do you, uh, what do you what, go for? What is it about this? Peace of Light is just my, my revenge story, uh, my Western revenge story. It's my homage to, to the Westerns. I grew up on Westerns. I love Westerns. You know, my dad was a big fan, and I just wanted to write something that would be worthy of a Western genre. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you think about the narratives that come out of Westerns, revenge is just so, you know, dish served cold. It's, it's made, like the Westerns were made for revenge stories. So I just wanted to create something that I thought would be fun for readers to read, something that I thought would be fun for me to write, and that's where we have our pregnant Mexican teen who definitely wants to seek vengeance against a vile Texas sheriff that, you know, took away everything that she loved. And um, the way she comes about being a gunslinger is she learns how to become a gunslinger uh, through her estranged fugitive brother. Uh, so her brother, he's a, he's wanted, uh, he's a gunslinger himself, but um, it's interesting for what he's wanted for. I just kind of hinted it a little bit in the story. I don't go too much in it, but again, if we had ever pick up or we go into backstories, we would definitely show this, but there's a comment where the sheriff hints on what he does. And basically I did my research. And in that point in time in history which is a crazy time, but people would be hung or lynched kind of like for sport almost yeah. um, as a spectacle. Um, so Mexicans would get lynched slaves as well, lynched, you know, or crooks, any, any race too would get lynched, you know, but it, it was, it was a spectacle. Um, so I wanted to show, okay, our bad guy, our fugitive has some layers to him, right? So what he's wanted for 
is, of course, you know, halting lynch proceedings or raiding lynch proceedings for stopping them, you know. So, you know, if you stop a lynching, of course, that's a crime. So that's kind of one of the things that he's won uh, for. But if you like Tarantino, um, if you like Westerns, um, it's hard boiled, it's cutthroat, it, it, it's gritty, you know, it's tenacious. Um, it's not short of your, the racial slurs. I mean, we are, it is a period piece and I'm not trying to promote hate or anything like that. I'm just trying to be real with the time setting, be real with, I mean, if you look at Django Unchained, how many times they said the N word, how many times we've seen uncomfortable situations with what they did with the slaves, right? Like how you had the two guys fighting, right, to the death and the winner gets to sleep with, you know, he'll put him to pick what any slave he wants to sleep with, you know, it was, it was, it's just, these are just small, small, small situations that we're touching on, but you could imagine how deep and dark it goes and the truth that's actually there in the historical setting during slavery that probably won't be touched upon or probably people don't want to touch upon. There's a lot of atrocities there. So the, the, the time period is rife for that type of, you know, um, storytelling. So again, that's, it's just, I like to create controversial things. I like to create thought provoking things. I like to create good entertainment or what I think is good. As far as a Western concern, I felt pistol is something that it hasn't been done or has been done through a different lens, you know, cause on Reddit, I had posted it and not many people like the idea, I guess, of yeah, a, like pregnant, a pregnant gunslinger. They're like, Oh, well, Oh, let me guess. She gets her power through rape. Oh, that's not oh. new. I'm like, I'm like <laughs> people really say that. I'm like, hold on a second. Let me tell you about this. Where have you seen, you know, the the the, the perspective or the dynamic of a female getting raped, right? A teen at that, by by a lawman, right? And we see the revenge through her eyes and her being competent enough to to enact that revenge. Tell me that movie because I want to see that movie and like you know. <laughs> so my whole thing is you could just judge if you want to judge, but I'm just going to just put it out there that, yeah, I thought about that, but it's not an empowerment. It's not, no, it's just, this is a realistic thing. This is something that could have happened. And yeah. I'm trying to create a scenario out of something that people might not know could have happened in history. I'm not going to sugarcoat nothing. I'm just going to say, Hey, this was a dark time. And this was someone that got raped by a sheriff because not all sheriff are great. Just like not all cops are good. Just not like not everyone's a great person. There are some evil people in this world that are in positions of power. So I just wanted to create a Western that says, hey, we got the freaking blonde hair, blue eyed sheriff, who's, a, who's just a bad dude. There's not, not all of them are bad, right? But hey, this one was just a bad dude. Yeah. And, it's, and that's why I wanted to create my, my antagonist and try to, so that's what I, you know, this yeah. is, everything is for someone. If you don't like that and that turns you off, guess what? This book wasn't for you. Exactly. We'll, we'll find a reader that's gonna appreciate it. Like, I'm, not, I'm not big on Westerns, but I mean, like I looked at your, your video and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is a pretty cool, interesting concept because I don't care who you are, yeah. where you're from, how you grew up. Everyone likes a good revenge story. Everyone Hell loves, yeah! Hell everyone yeah! Loves Kill Bill. I mean, come on, it was. I love Kill Bill. Kill Bill's was a big influence. Big yeah, influence. It was amazing. Like some of the some of the bloody and special effects were like a little cheesy, but I mean, Uma Thurman with that sword running around, life mm -hmm. up with a box. I mean, come on. Yo, like you can't really that. No, Kill Bill is a is a classic to this day. Still holds up. I mean, if you think about it, it's over the top. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're gonna tell me this chick, Uma Thurman, who I love, who is awesome, who's amazing, is gonna learn the ways of the sword, right? Get her Hanzo sword and take out you know crazy eighty eight yakuzas, <laughs> like like if it's no one's business. I mean, I get she wants her revenge, but I mean realistically, are we being realistic? No, but it's Tarantino. It's over the top. We want the revenge because we saw the beginning, how it was so visceral, how it was so yeah. nasty, how it was just punishing. You know, the the bride, her groom killed. Like they took a moment of of such happiness, of such, and they destroyed it. And you have your bride there, and that's a symbol. That just on the beginning alone, you're like. I want to see this girl. Yeah, I want to see how she comes out of it. I mean, when they buried her alive, she broke out of the coffin with her mess. Yeah. Four inch punts, like all the way up there. She yeah. got out. I was like, it's oh, amazing. Yeah. I'm it a sucker for Tarantino. I love it. It's so. really good. I, I can go with that. So let me uh, put my screen back over here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I, I, I resonate with you a lot with what you're doing. And mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of, and it's funny, a lot of the people who have submitted their work to me, the interviews, 
Um, like I follow their tweets most of the time, and most of them are just like you and me. Like we don't agree with the thing or anything like that. We want to tell stories because it's something that we like to do, and we want to tell good stories, not make mm-hmm. good characters and tell a crappy story or mm-hmm. tell a crappy story and make it better. Like I think you would agree as a creator that the first thing mm-hmm. you should probably do when you're writing a story is character development. You come up with characters, mm-hmm. you hash them out, you flesh them out, you make them work it, and then you go into making the, the, the story that accompanies that character. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what writers do. I mean, we're in 2019 now where everyone gets triggered over every little thing. I'm like, mm-hmm. It's sad. It's 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 it, it ruins a lot. But it, it's it's the world we're in. We're so super sensitive. Where I'm like, hey, we can disagree, and still be friends. I that's, that's the way I see it. Like my grandma, we debate all the time because obviously my political spectrum. I'm on the right. She was mm-hmm. on the left, but my grandma has a reason to be on the left because she grew up in the civil rights movement. She has all that experience to where you know yeah. hatred was a big. Back That's back. it's just what it is. It's a history that not many people want to talk about, but this is real, dude. There's a residual effect just from the civil rights, just from when slave when slavery was done. It wasn't like, hey, we're, hey, we're free, we're living a normal life. No, they didn't even have a family structure. I mean, they were growing up where their their kids are getting sold, where, where like husband and wives are getting split up. Like they, I mean, and then you put them now they're free, like everything's normal. No, it wasn't. And then you go into civil rights. Like there's so much there. There's a lot to unpack where you can't just brush. It under the, the carpet. I would, I would say kids or minorities who are my age, in really um, like to them, and I'm not trying to be insensitive or anything, but to them, like slavery is a very sensitive topic. It's, mm-hmm. You know, it is, but you know, all that stuff happened slavery, civil rights movement, you know, all of that happened so that you could live free in 2019. Mm-hmm. There's really no reason why you should think you should feel oppressed. In mm-hmm. any way, shape, or form, there's no reason why you mm-hmm. think that you should view slavery as a some part of the time. Because mm-hmm. you didn't live through slavery, your parents didn't through slavery, your grandmother and grandfather probably lived through the civil rights. But I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not saying, oh, everyone should be correct. That's not what I'm mm-hmm. saying. What I'm saying is, is that be grateful that the people went through it so that you can be free in 2019. You know, I, just, I get, I get. I get triggered when I hear people using that as a Trump card. I'm like, word. You know? It's not a Trump card. It's even now, if you think about our youth, there's a lot that don't understand slavery. Like they just don't like, oh yeah, it happened. But to that, it's not like you don't understand the extent. You don't understand all the severity. Again, I get that. That's a whole other thing. And even if you want to talk about consequences and such, like even in promoting in Pisoleta in Reddit, or no, this was on Twitter. Mm-hmm. This was on Twitter. Somehow I got attacked by an SJW Spider-Man. I don't know how that happened. SJW Spider-Man. You're going to have to describe that a little bit more. Literally. No, seriously. Like, if you Google him, he has a Twitter account. And I, I posted something on Image Comics talking about my pistol at a pitch getting rejected. But I did it as a way to create kind of publicity so people could know about it. Yeah. Not that I really care that I got rejected. It, it's image. I, they picked the cream of the crop. I, I'm a nobody. I'm obscure. It, it, it's going to take me a time before I can get anything where image would even consider me. And I understand that. It was just trying to create a buzz or whatever. So he hit me up kind of nasty, whatever. And I hit him back up. And I'm like, dude, you know, Spider-Man, you know, like, you know, like, you know, SJW you are, but you're not a Spider-Man. And he fired back. Well, like, you're not a comic book creator. And I was like, okay. I'm like, well, I created this. I cried in front of this. I created that. So it's like, you're saying I'm not a comic creator but I was able to create some stuff. So in talking about Pistoleta, one person was like, oh, we've seen that, another revenge thing. Oh, the white man is the bad guy, a person of color, you know, that's brutalized or whatever. I'm like, you're diminishing it, but I'm like trying to say there's something different about Pistoleta. Trust me, I, yeah, as a Christian, I put a little spiritual message. Oh, so what? you telling me the white guy gets, the white cop gets forgiven? After all that, he gets forgiven? After raping her, he gets forgiven? Oh, my God. Where's the consequence? Where's the consequence? He's all, I'm like, dude, I'm like, you heard about slavery? I'm like, where was the consequences for the slave owners? Where's the consequences? They're suffering. You know, they made fortunes, you know, off the back of slavery. Like, where's their consequences? Like, he never responded back. Like, like you're saying, it's almost like when you get triggered with the Trump card. Yeah. You know, like about, I, it, it's almost like that got me. I'm like, dude, is you're picking apart a book, but then, I'm trying to put some historical value to it, but at the same time, you're not even understanding no, the mean, consequences that never were faced back then. But it's just like, again, man, I, I, I love everybody. Okay, I'm going to say that first of all. I love everyone, and I know these kind of talk can push people off, but I'm just trying to say, listen, 
as much as we are different, we still are, are alike, but there needs to be some type of respect for everybody else and for their walk, mm -hmm. for their story, because everybody has a story. Everyone has oppression. Everyone has an oppression. Everyone been through oppression. It happens. But if you look at every little bit and understand it, you could under, you could kind of get even in our even in our country systematic oppression. There's so much like, dude. They, I work in a school system. I see things. I'm like, man, if only we could put budget into this. If only we could. This would go on and on. All I want to do is spark change and create awareness. And for me, the best way to do that is through my comic books. So that's just why I'm going to always have different type of stuff as a writer. Wanna, and a, I, I kind of go back to you know, like what I do. I, I want to be able to inspire young generations. Hell yeah. If you want to write a book, write a book. If you want to go to Hollywood and pass, go to Hollywood and pass. Like, there should be no type of psychological wall that would prevent you from going to go do things that you want to do. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people just say, oh, because I'm black, I probably won't be able to do this because of some type of depression. And I'm like, well, where do you get that mentality? Mm -hmm. Like, that that shouldn't be. How, mm -hmm. how did that even come out? Like, how, I don't understand, like, you live in the country that's leading the world right now, and everything is free. We have freedom of speech, we have rights. Right. We live in the greatest country, I'll say that, as far as free. Like, we have a lot. There's a lot of good thing about them. I love it. And you just want to come out and see this. Like, I remember, like, uh, I was talking to one of my older sisters, and she was saying, she's very into that Black Lives Matter thing. She's mm -hmm. so convinced that she didn't get a job because she was black. I don't, I don't think that. I just probably think that whoever got the job is just more qualified. And if you're using that as a stigma to say, well, you know, I'm oppressed and I can't get by because there's all these different people who couldn't have stumbled in my store and they me back. I'm like, well, you're never going to get anything. No, you got to have self. Like, I get, like, I get that stigma and I, I kind of understand that. Um, but at the same time, there's a body of work that you put out as your brand, mm -hmm. right? This is my brand. And I understand. And when it comes to jobs, people's always going to get connections. People always going to get hookups, and that's how the world works. That's another thing too. The, the friends, show me your friends. And I'll show you your, you know, you know how good you'll do in business. It's just, it's just what it is. It's one in one. Um, you could say that, and that type of mindset, it'll just keep you hindered from fulfilling a potential because, like, some people will just, I'm gonna get this done. I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna get it done. Imagine, like, if we if we keep that into an entertainment. Uh, perspective. Imagine if Jordan Peele was like, man, I'll never get to do stories because, you know, this is going to shut another brother down or even though he's half white, but he identifies probably more as a black person just because of his skin and it's, it's just just because even white people probably just didn't even know he was half white. Like him growing up, he has... Uh, it, exactly. So I'm just... It, right. So, but imagine if he had that mindset, well, I'll never get anything done. Well, no, he put his stuff out there. He created a comedy and his shows. And then he got to the point where he was able to pitch Get Out and it got made and it was just a success. And then like, he could do us. And, you know, I even did a, a video saying how he's not racist. He's just saying, hey, we, we've seen movies where if you think about Hollywood and if you think about all the movies that have been made in the history of the world, like the majority have been white feature film or white protagonist. I get that. So he's like, I seen that I, it's been done. He's married to a white woman. You get what I'm saying? He's not racist. He's just trying to, he's trying to just rep his people. You know, it's like, I just want to rep my people. Like he just you wants to rep. I, I, I haven't seen, and I'm admitting it on this, this broadcast. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen get out and I haven't seen us. Not because, um, it's a minority movie. Cause that's, that's, that's a load of crap that I've been doing. Mm -hmm. It's because that when you get a movie that's primarily African American, that is a horror movie, it is the scariest shit you will ever watch. Mm -hmm. The scariest movie I've ever watched in my life was Tales from the Hood. Oh, yeah, I've oh, seen Tales from the Hood. Oh, yeah, that was tough. That's tough. Stuff. Both movies are tough. I get, for that reason, not wanting to watch it, I don't blame you. Do me a favor, though. When you get the courage, when you build up the courage, watch at least. I saw Us. I'm not crazy about it. But Get Out, for me, is a masterpiece. It's the only type of story that could come. Like, you know how you say, hey, I like indie creators. I like the Comic Escape movement. I like kind of like this new type of stories that are coming out. If you look at Get Out, okay, and when you watch it, it could be a, that could be a talk. That could be its own show just talking about, you know, the themes in there. It's done in a way that creates awareness. But it's not done in a way that's a ham-fisted agenda. It's just a it's a bad, it's a movie that went there, and it's thought-provoking, dude. It is like 
it's powerful, dude. And I had a good discussion with one of my buddies and he, he could see, see things from a different way. And then like, I could see things like, Hey, well, listen, here's the oppressive way. Here's the, the, where the sunken place is like they, how they keep them down. And, but you could see it in another way, dude. It's so, it's so good. Like I can't, I can't even talk more about it cause you haven't seen it, but trust me, it is, it is horrifying in certain ways and, and it'll, it'll get you in the feels. It, it's that kind of movie. Um, but it's, it's brilliant. Okay. It's a masterpiece. Like I, I'm just telling you, it's something worth watching. Okay. You can have a talk on that, but trust me, when you watch that, we'll talk. It is put it like this, okay? I showed that movie. I sat with my mom, okay? Because I saw it in the theater and I just loved it. And I bought it on Blu-ray because of Carousel. I select movies I gotta own. So you know, I'm like, mom, watch this. So I don't like her. I'm like, mom, trust me, just watch it. She watched the movie Get Out, okay? At the end, she's like, "Do you have another movie like this?" I'm like, sorry, mom. This, this kind of movie just one look at. She she just loved it, dude. She's like, I want to watch something else like this. I'm like, sorry, mom. Like, we'll just have to wait for his next movie to come out because he only he can do that type of thing. It's because yeah. he 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 can do that. So yeah. uh, I keep that in mind. I'm on a three day weekend this weekend, so I might. Likewise, me too. Yeah, yeah, dude. Trust me, trust me. To do it, dude. Trust me. I'm. It's not on YouTube. I don't know if it's not on Netflix, but. Red box, whatever. Just find a way. Amazon Prime. I don't know if you could do video or something. Watch it with the. I got, a, I got a bunch of Google credits that I can. Uh, you Dude, it's you know what's good. And you know what would be fun. Like you watch it, I watch it, right? Uh -huh. And then we'll do like a show, just talking about our thoughts on Get Out, because it will have a fresh perspective and we can relate it to like it, it's that good. Where it's well, worth. I'm, I'm gonna hold you up to that. I'm gonna hold you well, up. To that. Yeah. If you're gonna do it, let me know. DM me. Let me know. Like you're gonna watch it. I'll watch. I'm telling you, I'll watch it. And we'll be fresh, and we'll have notes, and we can get into a good talk about because it, it's that worthy. It's all. I think it was 99% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, it got a good. And, like, and that one person couldn't give it fresh, really, dude, to make it 100% off the board. Like, come on, dude, it was that fresh. You can't get any more fresh than that movie. For sure, man. Well, Gilbert, man, it was nice yeah. talking to you. Dude. I think we're going on like an hour and a half. For dude, well, we gotta cut it out because we we, can, we got a good flow where we can keep it going. But the show gotta end for sure. You gotta sleep. I gotta sleep. But yes, sir. Next time you let me know when I'm I'm down to do it any any other time, brother. I got you. So, guys, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys are interested in checking out Fiscal Letter, go to his Indiegogo page. The Kickstarter page is done, but he is running an Indiegogo page um, that's out. currently going. And when does it end? Um, it's set for 21 days. So uh, I think it's some, somewhere in May it'll end. I'll probably just end it right there. So it's a small goal, $1,000. Hopefully we can make it. And definitely get in. Get in on your copy because it's definitely something fresh, something new. All right, guys. You heard that from the creator, Gilbert. Thank you for coming on my show, man. We had a great time. And I hope the audience will for having me. Hour and a half of two messing around and talking. But Bear with us, man. It's a good one. And, dude, what, remember I told you about the live streams? Yeah. Some of the comic skate live streams go up to like three hours. Really? Of course, they got the audience for it, but I'm just saying we'll we'll get to there. We'll graduate to that point. So. That audience, maybe we can do the get out things live. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get there. I think I got like 57 subscribers on my YouTube channel. Or something Dude, like I'm at I'm at 40 something. We got a long way to go. That that live discussion will come like eventually. So one day, one day. if you, if you're down, DM me and we can, we can set it within a 20 minute parameter, just as a quick talk, and we could you know you can edit it afterwards, but. Something to think about. Again, Will, thank you for having me. I appreciate no you, brother. Problem, man. We'd love to have you on the show. So keep me posted, you know, my Twitter. If you're running any more campaigns, shoot me a link because, you know, nine times out of ten, I'm going to, I'm going to back. Not nine, nine, ten times out of ten, I'm going to back. You. Appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. I'll definitely keep you in the, in the loop for sure. Um, get some rest, dude, and I will, I will talk to you on Twitter. All right. Sounds good, brother. Later. Later. All right. Hey guys, how you doing? So I just went to the comic book store and got some cool stuff that I wanted to share with you guys, all right? So first off, got a lot of cool comic books here. We know Avengers Endgame is right around the corner, so I picked up a few Infinity War comics. Check that out. Got another one here, Avengers. Another one, and I like this cover because that's actually Nebula holding the Infinity Gauntlet. So, might be a little hint to what might happen in, in uh, Endgame, but hey, that's cool. And I also got this more latest edition of Infinity Wars, but the one thing that I'm most excited for is this little cute Thanos holding a death balloon mini hero. Like, look at that. That's, that's cool, all right? So here's the deal, you guys. I am giving all of this stuff away for free. 
All you got to do is go to my website, toBeHeroic.com, or go to my profile. My link is there. Fill out the form. Make sure you guys got a valid email address and submit to enter. It's it. Simple. Easy. Just go to my website, fill out the form, and you can win this whole prize pack, all right? You got until Friday, April 26th, all right? Around the time Avengers Endgame is out. So go right now, go to my website, fill out the form, and you can win. All right, guys, see you later.